Hi boys and girls. Today's video is somewhat redundant. Um, <laughs> I say that because um, what I'm going to talk about is there's literally eight other videos on YouTube which you could all leave me and go ahead and watch and basically talk about or see see someone talk about the, the same subject matter on a radio. Um, I'm going to try to make this a little bit different as to not waste your time. Um, and there's been a lot of talk and discussions about this radio from different members of uh, the New Jersey Antique Radio Club that, that's been on our uh, dis discussion group uh, via the internet. And uh, I actually learned a few things that I didn't know myself. So that being said, I figure I'd share some of this knowledge with you and hopefully you'll find it entertaining. Um, before I get started though, I, would, I, I do appreciate everybody that's uh, signed on to my channel and uh, become uh, uh, subscribed and uh, before you leave today uh, you, you can either do it now or before you leave I'd really appreciate if you gave things a thumbs up and and uh, just remember to like share and subscribe like other other creators of these the YouTube formats say so um, let me get on it Okay, so why do why am I so excited over the RCA BP-10? Well, it's an okay radio. It's not a fantastic radio. It's not a junky radio. It's a middle-of-the-road radio, but it's very important, especially to the history of radio. What I say by that is that it's the first radio that was considered a, I'm going to put this in quotes, personal portable radio. Now, first of all, so just so you can get a better understanding of where I'm going with this, you have to go, let's go back in time to let's say the early 20s where, you know, radios and phonographs were, were, were there to entertain us. You know, there was no, uh, you know, they, were, they were big and bulky and cumbersome. Uh, they weren't exactly portable, although uh, here, here's a picture of, uh, of uh, Armstrong with uh, his then, uh, well, his wife, but it was at that time they were dating. And here they are on the beach listening to Armstrong's uh, invention of the first super heterodyne portable radio. Well, that portable radio was over 50 pounds. I mean, we have, a, we have one of those radios in the New Jersey Antique Radio Club Museum, which uh, I strongly recommend. If you, if you go to be in the New Jersey, especially the central New Jersey area, you got to go go to Info Age and uh, visit our museum, the Info Age Science and History Center, and we have one of those radios that, that you can see for yourself that uh, Armstrong uh, uh, made back in the twenties. I don't remember the year specifically, but radios were basically big and bulky, and they they just weren't made to travel. And even even the crank up phonographs at the time, they were the same way. I mean, you could. They were big and bulky. There were some portable ones that weren't so bad, but they were all wind up and, you know, they, they just really, as far as today's portability with our electronics of today in 2024, they were, it would just be, you know, it's laughable. But that was the norm back then. So, um, you know, and, and also there, there was no television. I mean, television was just a kind of a, you know, an idea and, there were there was scanning disc TV and then there was no internet, there were no computers, cell phones. TikTok was the sound of a clock. That's what the sound of a clock made back then. So, all that being said, let's move up a little bit. Let's go to say 19, 1930s. How did this come to fruition? How did this radio come to be? Well, there were a number of different things. But uh, I think the main thing was, and this was something that was discussed, was spy radios. And various countries and governments were spying on each other, making radios in a very tiny package. They used very, very small tubes. Um, here's a picture right here. You can see uh, an example of uh, one of the tubes that was probably used back then. Um, they weren't plugged in either. You probably either had a to a wire wrap or a solder them into a circuit. And uh, it, it just kind of proved to, to some engineers that, you know, we you can make something like this in a small package and, and make it lightweight and easy to be portable and to travel. So in 19, so let's say about the mid-30s or so, 
I believe that's the time frame that RCA came up with this line of miniature tubes like what we know today, venture battery tubes, like what went into, uh, say, 50s uh, transoceanics and strato worlds and, and, and a lot of battery portables, those like 4 and 5 tube battery portables, you know, like uh, 1R5 and uh, 1L6 and 1U4 and uh, maybe a 3Q4 or a 3V4 for an output tube, those kind of miniature tubes. Now, the BP-10 used four one volt tubes. They were all rated around 50 milliamps current draw, and that became an important thing too because you didn't want to, you know, that, that was going to be the most of the current draw right there was just lighting up the filaments. And they also, later on in 1940, when they started, well, just before they released uh, selling the, the, the BP 10s, they came up with the 67 and a half volt battery. And that was your B power supply, which powered up the radios. So, not only that you've made the radios smaller, more power, more portable, um, battery access was certainly a lot easier. I mean, it, just uh, for, for the A battery was just a single D battery. You can use a single D battery now and stick it in a BP-10, fire it up, and you're off to the races. And it was a very small package, so even all together with the batteries, the thing came in, I think just under 4.3 pounds was uh, my research uh, came up with that. So that's a big deal, especially for 1940. Um, so let me show you, um, I have my, my BP-10 here, which is unfortunately not, it works, but not really well. But let me show you the guts of mine. Ten. And if you look over here to the left, where I got my pointer, this is where your A battery would go, right in here. Your B battery, the 67 half volt battery, is right here with these two terminal connections here. And then you have your four tubes. You've got one here. There's one directly underneath of that here. You have a, a, a tube here and a tube here. So these are all your four tubes. And uh, here's your your tuner right here which is actually connected there's a thumb wheel on the outside of the radio here and you know all your point-to-point -point wiring and all that stuff is all under here now this is a working radio but there's an issue and I I was reading somewhere where someone had commented on the uh, the audio transformers sometimes on these were bad and although this is working, it's working with not very much volume, and I spent hours thinking I had an alignment issue. But uh, I haven't gotten around to actually trying to fix this thing the right way yet. And like you'd see in any other video, if you wanted to hear the radio play, you just simply open up this lid. And here's the front of the radio here. You've got the volume control up top here where my, my thumb is, if you can see there on the right. And then your tuner is down here. Now, it's a great little radio. I'm going to fix this sometime, but right now I have too many repair things going on that I'm doing for other people. So, here's the back cover of this radio. And here's the, uh, get a little more specific, you can see the tube lay out there and where the batteries go okay but one thing now I, I was talking about earlier on about redundancy and how you now there's a million videos about this but I'm going to show you a couple things that I didn't see in any of the other videos first of all let me move this off to the side because I gotta do a little comparison here there was this radio and how ironic how close does that look to the RCA? It's it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but they're they're literally the same size radio. This, folks, came out the same time, or maybe a little bit after. Um, I couldn't quite find a a chronological date, but this is the Westinghouse WR682A, and this is literally identical to the BP10 on top. Now, there is one difference between the two radios. When you open up the lid, it also acts as the on-off switch. 
Now that squeal of the radio is working, but since I have a big LED light shining on this thing, let me turn this thing sideways. This is a working Westinghouse version of this radio. Now, one difference that I learned is, or one thing that I learned about these radios, is that there were actually two different runs of the BP-10. Okay, the Westinghouse, as you see here, when you open up the lid, oh, I can't get my thumb in there. There we go. If you look to the left, there's usually some radios had this little latch that held the lid directly up because the lid also acts as your antenna. So if I rotate the radio, you see how well that worked when I rotated that? Okay. So this one, as you can see, does not have a latch to hold the lid up at a 90 degree angle. Whereas this BP-10 here, the RCA version, does. You see this little latch right here? You can actually lift it to a point. There's like a detent. I don't know why it's not staying up. All right. But that would normally hold this up at a 90 degree angle. There might be, maybe the metal is bent or something. I don't know. But that this would actually hold this up. So here's one of the things that I learned from the folks in my club here is that the earlier versions of the BP-10, and in this case this Westinghouse right here, does not have the latch. So they had two runs of this radio, once without the latch, like the Westinghouse here. So this is an early run version. I think these were also made by RCA, I may be wrong. They were just branded Westinghouse. Um, the RCA is a later one because it had the latch here on the side. So that's one thing I learned. So the Westinghouse I saw at a JD auction. And if you haven't been to a JD auction yet, I highly recommend going because you'll find items like this. This I picked up in my, if you remember my video where I talked about how I spent over $1,000 at the auction? I found this at the auction. And when I was walking around doing, you know, an inspection or everything, just to familiarize myself with everything going on, when I lifted up the lid, and this thing was actually playing at station inside a metal building, I said, if this doesn't go for too much money, it's coming home with me. Well, it got some interest, but I think I ended up paying like $40 for this. And I thought that was just a smoking good deal because I know where it came from. It came from the same estate that I brought home those two Zenith radios. He was an RCA recording engineer for many years. I brought this home. So it's just my... Uh, and actually, there, there's going to be a JD auction coming up in the, this April. So... Uh, Go to jdauctions.com, or jdauctionsllc.com. I'll put that up on the screen for you. Go check that out. So working, not working yet, but will be working eventually. <laughs> also, I forgot to add, <laughs> this actually has a leather case. So you can actually put the radio, either of these radios, in this nice leather case. So they did come with a case. The, there was a carry strap on this, though. But unfortunately, it's missing. and it must have broke off or something along the way. But I plan on fixing that sometime, because I think that would just be cool. Now you can carry it with this. Okay. 